If you were a state governor and you knew that there was a good chance that violent looters would be active in your state, what would you do? Would you wait to see what happens first and then send in authorities to clean up the mess? Or would you be prepared and stage resources to quickly react to cut down on potential illegal activity? We'll look at how these two approaches have played out in Washington State and South Dakota in this episode of Analysis Behind the News, where we provide the perspective that you can use to restore American liberty and independence. The city of Seattle has been in much of the news lately, given that at least a six city block area has been taken over by protesters after police were ordered to abandon their precinct building. So how's that going for them? Those in charge have set up free medical and food stations on many street corners, as well as convincing city officials to have portable toilets brought in. And news reports indicate that poetry readings, speeches, and movie showings have been occurring. However, the Seattle police report that armed checkpoints have been set up by demonstrators who are trying to extort protection money from residents and business owners, although a local news reporter was unable to substantiate that claim. What is for sure is that without access to the precinct building, 911 response times have tripled since the closing of the precinct on Monday, June 8th. Just how many residents of this self-declared no-cop zone still rely on the police for emergency services is not clear. The situation has caused some angst in not only the local area, but in D.C. as well, with President Trump threatening to fix the situation himself if local leaders cannot regain control. But leftist Seattle has a history of coddling these types of activists. The Seattle Times gave four examples, and it reported, On March 8, 1970, more than 100 members of United Indians of all tribes and their allies took over Fort Lawton, which would later become part of Discovery Park. Months of demonstration ultimately led to construction of the Daybreak Star Indian Cultural Center in 1977. The center hosts a permanent art collection and serves as a Native American cultural space. In October 1972, Latino activists, after months of negotiations with Seattle leaders over community space, occupied the shuttered Beacon Hill Elementary School. Dozens stayed to sleep in classrooms after a tour of the abandoned building. After spending months there, demonstrating and even occupying city hall chambers, the school building was renovated and the community group El Centro de la Raza had a home. The, so the social justice organization remains influential today. In November 1985, a group of people moved into the vacant Coleman School in Seattle's Central District and said they would not leave until the school became a museum and community center. Activists remained in the building for more than eight years. The school eventually became the Northwest African American Museum. In 2013, an occupation of Seattle Public Schools' Horace Mann Building by members of groups that work with black youth ended in arrests of four people. So, ladies and gentlemen, it should come as no surprise that according to MyNorthwest.com, City Council member Kashama Savant tweeted Thursday night that she wants the now empty East Precinct converted into a community center. She plans to introduce legislation to that effect at some point in the days ahead, ultimately hoping to have the building operate with a focus on restorative justice. Mrs. Savant is a member of the Socialist Alternative Political Party. On the flip side of all of this, is how rioting was handled in South Dakota. Governor Kristi Noem told Fox News, I pre-staged National Guard troops in several different communities in South Dakota so that they would be ready if needed. And it was needed in Sioux Falls on Sunday night. So within minutes of the mayor asking for National Guard troops, they were on the scene and were able to shut down a lot of the violence that was going on. Really what National Guard did is come in and secure an area 
so more law enforcement could move to where the crowd was at. But it was incredibly important to be there on site and be ready to respond within a couple of minutes. So she was prepared to protect businesses and residential property. And then when local law enforcement asked for assistance in identifying looters through security camera footage, the public overwhelmingly responded by providing leads for the police to investigate. Did Washington Governor Jay Inslee offer this level of protection to his state and support to his law enforcement? Media reports seem to indicate that Inslee activated the guard after the damage was done. And he did so on three separate occasions until finally, earlier Sunday, Inslee activated more guard members to help clean up Seattle and prepare for potential afternoon protests. Inslee said the guard members will be unarmed and under the direction of city leadership. They'll be on hand to help clean up from Saturday's riot, protect the city from further property damage, and manage crowds and traffic during protests. Yet in statement after statement, Inslee appears to be more concerned about the right of protesters than about the illegal actions of those within the protest. Again, MyNorthwest.com reports the governor said, thousands were protesting peacefully against an atrocious act of brutality. This cause confronts a different kind of destruction, one that can't be fixed with new windows, graffiti scrubbed walls, or insurance. The message behind the demonstration was compelling and one all of us should share. We will not allow vandalism or destruction to obscure the protest central call for justice. So what does this signal to the criminal element within the protest movement? It sounds like, come on in, we'll clean up your mess. But not in South Dakota, where the governor said that rioting, looting, and mob rule would not be tolerated. According to audio of Governor Nome provided by KSCJ.com, the National Guard troops are specifically trained to be security guards and military police. So they are there to assist local law enforcement, highway patrol, to take what actions are necessary. She also said that the troops are armed and available as long as they are needed. She demonstrates that there are legal and physical consequences to illegal actions. Governor Inslee, on the other hand, seems to be keeping in lockstep with the many radical leftists that have come before him in dealing with the criminal element. Law and order is extraordinarily important in a country that is based on the rule of law. Maintaining that is what separates us from the phony republics around the globe that have great reading constitutions, but are never enforced by their national police or are rarely upheld by their kangaroo courts. To learn more about how these riots are being used to transfer control of the police from local to national, we ask you to please view our 2016 video, What's Happening to Our Police. Please share that with others and consider getting more involved in supporting your local police. Links are in the description or head over to jbs.org and look for our Support Your Local Police Action Project. I'm Bill Hotton for the John Birch Society, and until next time, stay informed, stay active, and of course, stay safe, patriots.